Dr. Sharfstein, it's August 30th. I am thunderstruck by what appears to be the nakedness of the under age 12 crew. When a nine year old gets COVID, what happens? Well, generally speaking, it's not a particularly severe infection. Um, it can feel like a cold to the nine year old. Uh, there are more rare cases, which are now in general more common because so many nine year olds are getting sick, where the kids can be sick like adults and get quite ill. And for that reason, because there's so many cases overall, we're seeing more kids very sick. We're seeing the hospitals filling up in the South and a real crisis in intensive care unit beds in some places like New Orleans. What is your anticipation of what back to school will look like in the heavily COVID hospitalized areas and then away from that as well? Well, in some of those areas, school's already started. And what we're seeing is that there's a lot of infection in the community, like there is, it's gonna come into the schools, it's gonna start spreading unless there's a lot of protections, and in many cases there aren't. So we're seeing huge numbers of kids being quarantined and schools basically shutting down as teachers are getting sick. You know, we have to try to avoid that if we're gonna have a successful school year. I think in other places um, where, first of all, they have the advantage of the community not having as much COVID because there's more vaccination, um, then uh, also they're going to be putting in place different mitigation measures, including testing and masks. I think that there's a good shot at a pretty reasonable start to the school year, but we're going to have to learn based on what we see. Dr. Sharfstein, what's the message now from the United Kingdom where we did see uh, the number of cases come down and then start to tick back up, giving people uh, perhaps some sense of pause with respect to uh, some sort of herd immunity or how the trajectory of the Delta variant may differ from the previous one? Well, um, the message is you don't exactly know what's going to happen because I was doing some interviews with some people in the UK who said there's no chance that it comes down and then it comes down, you know, and now it's going back up a little. So, you know, it's really hard to be locked in to being sure what is going to happen. Um, but uh, the UK has a higher vaccination rate than the United States. It has a much higher vaccination rate than some parts of the United States. So I think it's a pretty fair bet to say that, uh, you know, we're going to see this virus burn through the population unless uh, people are vaccinated and precautions are taken. Meanwhile, there are some new variants that are being spotted in South, uh, in South Africa in particular. Is there anything that's catching your eye that we should be aware of that potentially uh, could hit yet again? Um, not particularly, um, although it is definitely possible. The biggest issue, of course, will be if there is a variant that uh, really can make people who are vaccinated sick. And I have not heard at this point about that emerging. Um, it's going to obviously be um, a big deal if that happens, particularly if it, it, particularly if it starts to spread. Staying globally there for a minute, there has been some concern that we're all talking about boosters here when other countries can't even get their hands on one shot. How do you respond to that? Well, um, it's hard to keep both things in our mind. We um, are sharing an enormous amount of vaccine. It's extremely important to scale up vaccine production around the world. And one of the best pieces of news, at least for me, was the news that Pfizer and BioNTech are starting a factory in South America, a continent that has just really been hit hard. Um, there are many countries that are realizing that the delivery parts of the vaccination effort are extremely difficult. And I think it's going to be important for us to do both, to make vaccine available here, because we have now one of the worst outbreaks, again, in the United States. But at the same time, just continue just to scale up and distribute vaccines around the world. Just bringing this full circle, we started the conversation talking a lot about schools and back to school. And I think this pandemic has reminded us that being doctors and being in public health, it's not only physical health, it is very much mental health. And not being in school has really hit some of the low income communities the most. How do you balance that knowing that they have to be in school? Well, I think that there are a lot of kids of every background who have suffered from not being in school in different ways. Um, but I, uh, but it's certainly true that uh, there has been a tremendous amount of academic challenges facing kids who haven't been in school and don't have good access to remote learning, for example. Um, we've got to balance these things. And I, I think that the basic formula is we bring kids back to school and we do everything we can 
within reason to protect them. We don't pretend the virus doesn't exist. We don't pretend that it's not a big deal. But we do, you know, put in place reasonable mitigation measures. I think the first phase of this pandemic was about older adults and people with chronic illness. The second phase is about trying to get young people vaccinated, meaning young adults. And I'm thinking it's quite possible that this next phase for the United States is going to be a lot about uh, school, protecting children, and all of us thinking about how what we can do to make sure that that's successful.